Good morning, good morning all members of the media. Thank you for coming this morning. I believe everyone has settled in. My name is Werner Riemann. I'm the Deputy CEO of Solidarity. I will, before I introduce the panel, uh, apologies there, there's a lot of mics. We will uh, we would shift it on as, 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 the, as the conference is continuing. Before I introduce the panel members, I would just make short notes of what the format of the conference would be. Uh, it, would, it would be a f short statement, firstly, by Dr. Dirk Herman, the Chief Executive of Solidarity, making introductory remarks and also explaining Solidarity's position pertaining to the instance at Basel Swaziland. Thereafter, Ms. Alana Barkaisen, who is an educator at law school Swaziland, would read a statement that I have not opposed to state that Ms. Barkaisen has actually been informed by an employer that since there is a formal process ongoing, she would not be able to elaborate on the merits of the case. But she does have a personal message and also a message of appreciation of the support that she, that she received during this very difficult time. After Ms. Barkaisen's statement, we will then move to Mr. Connie Mulder, the head of the Solidarity Research Institute. And it is there where Solidarity will also initiate and make, uh, uh, make it known what steps we are going to take apart from the formal legal process. We have already initiated that steps and we will share that with you. Mr. Connie Mulder would elaborate on that. After Mr. Connie Mulder, it would be Mr. Anton van der Beyl. Mr. Anton van der Beyl is the head of legal services at Solidarity. He in particular will elaborate on the formal process, the legal process that will follow uh, pertaining to, to Ms. Barkhuizen. And lastly, uh, I would then uh, just elaborate on a further process which we, which we have initiated. We will allow for a short question and answer session afterwards, but again, I just re reiterate that given the formal process, Mr. Barkhuizen will read the statement Uh, on TV. <laughs> if you have any claims, please it's to Mr. Werner Heeman and not Solidarity. I just want to make sure from a sound point of view, um, I know here's a lot of mics. Um, will the sound be okay if I use this mic as well on your mics or must I do this without this mic? Maybe your technical guys, is it this? Okay, like this. Thank you very much, and we really appreciate you coming here. Um, we know this is a matter of utmost importance for South Africa, and we believe that this specific case is part of building a democracy in South Africa, so we really appreciate you coming here. Solidarity is set to serve court papers before the end of this week, asking that the unlawful suspension of Swaziland teacher Yelana Barkaisen be lifted as a matter of urgency. Moreover, Solidarity will ask the South African Human Rights Commission to investigate the actions of the North West Education MEC, Selo Lehari, as well as the actions taken by several political parties. Solidarity will also request the leader of the Democratic Alliance, Musi Mayamani, to take disciplinary action against his youth leader, leader Loyolo Mpiti. Solidarity is also considering civil action following investigations, which may include a defamation claim, among others. Lehari's rash action has caused untold trauma to an innocent teacher and her family, who are fearing for their lives while her dignity was severely impaired. Moreover, she has been presented to the entire world as a racist. Without listening to the other side, political parties jumped on the 
populist bandwagon. The DA's youth leader even suggested on the radio that when racism is involved, prior investigation is not needed. Even going so far as to mention the particular teacher by name in a press statement. The fact that has been overlooked though is that Barkhaisen was neither employed by the state nor by the MEC as she had been appointed by the school's governing body. Moreover, her own class was not involved. She merely took the photo. Hence, the wrong employer acted and in the process a teacher was suspended in error. The life of an outstanding and beloved teacher was wrecked overnight by a Bundu court. The teacher who is known for her kind heart and for the sandwiches she brings from home for hungry children at school, black and white alike, has been suspended by an MNC standing on a pedestal acting in a manner that is totally unlawful. In effect, the Bundu court found her guilty in public and she received a phone call to inform her of her suspension. Her, past, uh, her post is a governing post, yet the MEC acted outside his powers, insisted on her suspension. No correct procedures were followed. No one paid heed to the legal processes. It did not matter to anyone that she was not the teacher at the class in question. Without following due process, she was unceremoniously charged, found guilty, and punished by the way of humiliation. The basic tenets of justice were not heeded, namely to listen to the other side too. This teacher now has to prove her innocence in face of any legal rule. Solidarity is going to represent Ilana Barkhaisen. Formal processes will reveal the true state of affairs. Several other investigations are currently underway, which will hopefully reveal the truth of what happened in the classroom. To the major embarrassment of many players, the true version will annul the Bundu court's verdict. The formal process will reveal that we are dealing with, in this instance, our teachers who cared. They had to make little ones who don't speak English or Afrikaans, only Twana, feel at home. They are educationists and they know that the most important thing on the first day is to make little ones feel secure in the new environment. The teacher in question went the extra mile by bringing her private domestic worker to school to act as an interpreter for the little ones. The kids in the class also help each other along. When she took that picture, Ilana Barkhaisen was not wearing the community's race-tinted glasses because that is not how she views the children in her class. It is for that stance that she now being vilified publicly. Solidarity has appointed a top legal team to represent her insofar as labor law matters are concerned. We will leave no stone and turn to take steps against every high profile official who was party to the Bundu law activities. South Africa is a constitutional state governed by rules and high profile government officials and political parties are required to obey those rules. 
Solidarity does not accept the Bundu cause ruling at all and will fight until justice prevails. The Bundu court's weakness lies in the fact that the truth does not matter to it. However, a court of law will expose it. If at this stage we allow people to get away with this kind of Bundu justice, it will become the rule rather than the exception. At this stage, the battle for justice has therefore only begun. For now, we are focusing on restoring Ms. Bargaisen's human dignity. Whatever the investigations into events in the classroom reveal, it was not her classroom, a huge injustice has been done to her and her family. She deserves an apology. And we want to appeal to South Africa to help restore her human dignity so that we do not lose an outstanding teacher. The little ones she teaches deserve it. I will now introduce her to you. Before I am doing so, I just want to introduce her via pictures as well. And this kind of photos is the kind of photos that nobody will publish on social media. But this is this kind of photos that actually shows a teacher that loves her children. All this photos in the background is photos of her class during last year. And this photos prove that surely she is doing something right. She is succeeding to integrate children from different backgrounds. Even children, when they came there, that could not speak a word of Afrikaans or English, is then integrated with their friends. And on those photos, you will see only happy faces. And for that, we want to say thank you. Thank you for that. On that specific day, when the world distributed one particular photo out of context for the rest of the world, there was another photo taken. And this is the photo of her class exactly the same time than the other photo. And on this photo, you can see happy children. You can see a young kid, great R, just received there, with his thumb up and say, I am okay. And my challenge to the media today is to publish that photo of a young kid on the first day, uncertain, because he is there for the first time, can't speak either Afrikaans or English, but they succeeded to help him to feel that okay that he sent a, a thumb and say, I am okay. My challenge to the media is to distribute that as well. The second photo here. Um, the one, uh, that photo there is of course the photo that is taken about exactly the same time that morning after the first photo. This photo shows kids playing together. And you can see kids that's happy. The first photo was in the beginning of the day with a challenge to make that kids feel at home. Literally, minutes later, they've succeeded to make that fee kids feel okay and to play with all the other kids. But this photo is not published. This photo is not distributed on the social media. 
And what we say is that let's present this teacher in a full context. And with these words, I want to introduce her to you. I just want to say again, and I, um, there was a, uh, there's a reason why she only can read the statement. And that is because a court process is ongoing right now on the one side. Unfortunately, on the other side, her employer also let her know that she can't speak um, to the media. So to protect her and uh, to protect her future, unfortunately, we can't allow questions and interviews. And that is on the one side from a legal point of view and also because of the employer's request. But we still decided, despite of this, to give her an opportunity to introduce herself to you on a personal level. She can't go into the merits of um, the specific um, case, but she can give you a personal point of view. She really, you must understand, the person that I have here teaches small children. This is it's totally from another world for her. And I want you to respect that. <laughs> that is something um, out of her world. And in that light, and I understand it's difficult for you guys that um, report in English. She asked whether she can speak in Afrikaans. We have translated it for you. So in your press packages, what she now will say in broad terms um, are also in English. And um, so I want to ask you, and I know it's difficult to, to respect and also to protect this wonderful teacher. Before you start, I just want to move all of this to you. Ik 
sien nu elke een van mijn kinders een nieuwe wereld ontdek. En ik help hulle om dit te bemeester. Ik zie nu onzeker de schouwerkies verander, een lachen zegjes en een vreugde na het drukkie. Ik stap samen met elke een van hulle dag voor dag, jaar na jaar. Mijn hart breek as ek hulle sien, wanneer hulle moet aanbeweeg. Maar ik is trots. Ik is trots om te zien hulle is raag vir die volgende stap. Want dit is wat hy jyvrou doen. Ongeag ras, ongeag hulle achtergrond. Een onderwijzer is die kers wat anderse vlammetjes aansteek. Al is dit ten koste van hulle self. Verlede week het my wereld verander. Een foto wat ek geneem het van een gelukkige klas vol kinderkies op hulle eerste schooldag is dier opportuniste tegen my, my kinders en my school gebruik. Onsekere graad R maaikies het op hulle eerste dag dier die media genadeloos uitgebuid. Wat er op het opwindende dag moest wees, was niet. Die gevolg was getraumatiseerde kinders, wat huil en by my sekerheid soek. En wat, en ek wat hulle probeer, kalm hou, terwyl ek self moet toekijk, hoe my leven verwoes word. Ik weet niet wat die mensen proberen om mijn leven te verwoesten. Ik weet niet wat ze wil recht krijgen. Ik weet niet dat ik machteloos moet staan en toekijk hoe ik van een verwoog veroordeel moest word. Hoe ik beledig geword het. En vertel word dat hulle my ken en hulle het my nog nooit gesien nie. Hier die mense het my nog nooit ontmoet nie. En hulle vertel precies wie ek is. Hoe hulle my goeie naam geslaan en geskop het. En toe vader geskop het vir die plezier daarvan. Ek gaan my nie laat vertel wat my waardes is dier enige iemand anders nie. Ek gaan hier die pad stap. Ik ga mijn naam skoon maak. Ek gaan hier die machtige mensen aanvat. En wen. Ek is een goeie onderwijzer. Ek is niet alleen in hierdie strijd nie. Voor allemaal wit en zwart in mijn gemeenschap en nationaal wat voor mij een boodschap of een gebed gesteer het. So ongelooflik, baie dankie. Ek weet dat ik niet op alles kon reageer nie. Maar ik ek wil net vir julle sê, ek het elke lieve boodschap gelees. En ik waardeer elke lieve bemoediging uit my hart. Vooral voor die ouders wit en zwart, wat herhaaldelijk voor die media en allemaal wat wel wou luister, wil ek baie dankie sê. Dit betekent voor mij ongelooflik baie. Ek moet nie vir my jammer wees nie. Ek gaan nie leen nie. Ek gaan beklaai. Ek gaan dood seker maak, dat wat met my gebeur het, nooit weer met enige ander onderwijzer gaan gebeur nie. Ek is met dit verskuldig aan my eie klasse, aan my mede onderwijzers, en elke kind in Zuid-Afrika, wat een goeie onderwijzer nodig het. 
Ons durf nie toelaat dat hierdie mense wat kom haat saai, twyfel en een onderwijzer sy hart laat ontstaan nie. Vir soveel kinders is onderwijzers dalk die enigste liefde en ondersteuning wat hulle kan kry. Vir amal is onderwijzers van die belangrikste vergere in hulle lewe. Ek sal nie toelaat dat hierdie kinders goeie onderwijzers ontneem word nie. Ek sal nie toelaat dat onderwijzers dier en tyd op eiers loop so dat die haatbende bevredig kan word nie. Ek is een goeie onderwijzer. Ek gee nie om oor enig iets anders as die welstand van elke liewe maaikie in my klas. Ek sal ten alle tyde doen wat die beste is vir my kinders in my klas. Nou ook, as ek nie het nie, was ek nie een goeie onderwijser nie. Ek is Jelana Barkhuizen. Ek gaan opstaan vir my, vir my klasie en vir elke ander onderwijser. Baie dankie Jelana, ek waardeer dit verskrikkelijk baie en ek denk van allemaal van onze kant dat ons jou dankie sê vir jou van behartigheid en teerlikheid. Thank you very much, we really appreciate it. Thank you that you opened your heart for us, we really appreciate it. Well, now it's so emotional, but let's then continue with what's the next step. So let's go just back to that specific reality. What we plan to do is, in the first place, um, now to go to court on an urgent basis. The papers will be filed before the end of this week. And that is to uplift the suspension. And I want to ask um, Anton van der Peil just to give us a, as a bit background on that. And that will be really, will be um, only short. Thank you, David. Um, there can be no dispute that the fundamental principle of our labor law is, or mainly that each party must be given an opportunity to state its case before any action is instituted against the person or is not followed in this process. Our Constitution, the Labor Relations Act, the employment of educators, Act subscribes to this principle and our urgent application which will be filed in this week will be predominantly based on this principle. Unfortunately, the Court of Public Opinion initially did not subscribe to this principle. Yolanda was offered no opportunity to explain her side of the story and given the opportunity she would not have been suspended. No action would have, could have been taken against her and her name and reputation would not have been tarnished almost beyond repair. We will ask the court whether Yelana's suspension was lawful due to the fact that, that we are of the view that it was unlawful. We have decided on an urgent application in light of the fact that each day that goes by she, uh, when she is not given the opportunity to clear her name and tell a story, is a day when her reputation will be further tarnished. Obviously, whilst we are of the view that due to the fact that she is a governing body appointment, the MEC and the Department of Education has no say in the process against her, they made themselves interested party or in effect demanding a suspension. There is no doubt that the MEC and the Department of Education will be cited in such an application and a punitive cost order will be got, uh, asked against them. After we have been successful in that application, we will proceed with a defamation action suit against the MEC and the Department of Education and other, party, or other parties involved. They said the predominant narrative that Yolana was a racist and, that they, and they need to be held accountable for this false narrative. 
There is no doubt in my mind that Ilana is good name and the reputation has been tarnished and that we shall accordingly be successful in such an application. It seems to be the norm these days, and especially with the forthcoming elections, that when there is alleged and unproven incident which is selectively perceived as a white person being racist towards a black person, that politicians and the public accepts and furthers, furthers this narrative uh, that the person is racist. This will stop with Elana's case. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Connie Mulder, Red of Solidarity Research Institute. Um, I think we've heard enough from Milano, and I think uh, the people in the dock should be the people in front of me. On the 10th of January, two women were found guilty of racism. The one by a police, police disciplinary committee, a General Sandra Maleva Tema. She was a major general. After a two-year investigation, she was found guilty of racism, and summary uh, dismissal was recommended. This story did not make the evening news. The other story was a photo of a single instance in a classroom in a grade R class in a rural town which had wall-to-wall -wall coverage. In 2017, the Solidarity Research Institute compiled a report that showed that when white racism is perceived, media coverage is extremely biased and one-sided, well, one-sided biased and completely out of proportion. This just once again proves that. Going forward, we were of the opinion that a loose cannon will eventually point at you, and this needs to stop at this moment. So opportunistic politicians who use this for their own gain will be held accountable. Accountability is one of the scarcest resources in South Africa, but we're going to be bringing some of that uh, to bear here. The, we've written to Musi Maimani, leader of the DA, in order to sanction his youth leader, who on Twitter for some reason exposed several children's identities without the consent of their parents and made a summary conclusion that the teacher is racist, knowing that there were other photos that showed the opposite. We've written to him, it's in your media package. Um, going further, uh, Barry will, accept, uh, will uh, elaborate a bit further, but there are a lot of people who are going to be saying sorry, and we would like them to start preparing if it's going to be verbal or written, because this is coming. Accountability is needed, and we'll make sure that the parties who need to say sorry are going to apologize. Thank you, Connie. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, most of what we said in our position has already been covered. The only add on I have is specific, specifically on the Human Rights Commission. As you know, the Human Rights Commission was, since the demonstrations has uh, taken place, they were uh, at the premises of the school. We've actually learned that they have now, it looks like they've moved on from Las Cosas Reineke for a moment where they are in tandem with the investigation of the Northwest Educational Department more on the broad theme of racism. They received complaints and claims, and now they have a full investigation on that. The question we asked is not so fast pertaining to the events at Swiss and Reineken. We specifically focus here, and our letter is contained in the back, we specifically focus here on MEC Lahari, his actions during that day, the protesters, and we must keep in mind what it is that, in effect, has been established. If you look at the sequence of events of that morning of 10 January, you'd find that the protesters were engaged in actually an illegal public gathering. It grew as the morning went on a bit more aggressive. That's what we contain in our letter. The growing swell of the protesters has actually resulted in the police who made the final call to say that the learners and the staff, for their own safety, must evacuate. We have, in this process, a few threats of violence, in particular from the Young Communist League and the SACP, stating that they would visit the school, they would be at the school on a regular basis, and they will make the school ungovernable. You have more uh, 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 very aggressive outcries for action and a promise not to leave the school. What's the effect on constitutional rights pertaining to this? And this is what we say in our letter. These actions do not have, it's not without consequence. And let's just say that that's what we request from the Human Rights Commission, just to have regard to the consequences and the damages that already have occurred. One of them is the learner's right to access to education has been impeded. This is significant. They couldn't have gone to school. 
And the experience of the first day of school was unfortunately not as they hoped for. The educators' right, especially Mrs. Barkaitan's right to freedom of movement, has been impede, impeded. She cannot move freely around the school. She cannot move freely around the town for her own safety. Her right to privacy has been violated by the MEC. Without having to do so, and it looks like in uh, concurrence with the principal and the SGB announced on a stage in the very school hall where she is an educator, announced her name and he announced it repeatedly, immediately elevating her name to the media, immediately uh, uh, raising her profile and actually make her an identifiable person. This is a serious, serious lapse of judgment from a person who also political, who is the political head of education in Northwest. Mrs. Barkhausen's right to a fair process has been tarnished. Because look here, the first uh, moments we have is it is condemned. You get many organizations who already treated this as the process has been con con finalized and the outcome has been reached. And in the end, she's already been found guilty. And that is why we launched this, one of the reasons why we launched this urgent application. So it cannot simply be acceptable that the continued demonstrations can be without some sort of investigations from the Human Rights Commission. If they are willing to uh, investigate and do an elaborate investigation, we would invite them and we kindly request them to supplement their current investigations with these renewed claims for, that's contained at, at the events. And we hope that the outcome would be that specifically MEC Lahari would be reprimanded, that it would be found that he was in the wrong, that he's, that he's found, that he indeed violated the constitutional rights of Ms. Barkhausen, that the leaders of the political formations who would do everything they can to hype up the tension, to hype up the, the, the racial talk and the racial heating at the school, be also be addressed to say there are real consequences. We believe this is their place, and if they are willing to uh, uh, do investigation, most surely they can add these aspects as well. Um, this is on the Human Rights Commission, and thank you for, for attending this morning. And uh, we will allow a short question and answer uh, session. We do ask that you just mention your name, your news outlet, or your media house. And if you can, keep the question as brief as possible. The gentleman in front here was first. And also include uh, uh, where, uh, um, to whom your question is directed. I'll take the further questions after the, the, the first one. My name is Malu Nyeloboy from ENCA. I've got two questions. The, the Education Department in the Northwest said they've suspended Ms. Barkhazen because she had been pointed out by the SGB and the school principal as the cow priest. And they're saying that they, they suspended her because they're doing an investigation. Surely, if the Department of Education is doing an investigation and they're investigating her, you wouldn't expect her to be at the, to be at the school. Two, when she took these photographs, what, 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 what was the aim? Did she see anything wrong with the way those pupils were seated? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I think what I should have done first is just to allow for a few questions to circulate and then we'll take them uh, one at a time. Thank you. There was a hand over here, and then a hand over there, and then a lady over there, and then we'll, after that round, we will we'll take another round. Um, just two quick questions. I'm Alex Mitchley from News24. The first question is, is Mrs. Barkhazen, was she a member of Solidarity? And uh, if she was, perhaps, for how long was it just now? That's the first question. Uh, second one is, is can Mrs. Barkays and then just, um, um, in terms of a statement, she was just there to take the photo, but is there any reason that the kids were seated that way for the first photo? Perhaps we can just clear that up once and for all. Then. Uh, thank you. I think that was a bit covered by that question over there, but that is written down. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
kids be grouped like that initially? What, what is, is it because of familiarity with each other? Is it, what is the reason for that? Why aren't they intermingled already from the get-go? Understood. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady over there. Thank you for that question. It's a very really important question. I think should we allow more questions or? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of fair. I think I'm from eyewitness news. You guys are, of course, um, representing Ivana uh, under local suspension, but they have been forced to the teacher responsible um, for segregating those children in the manner that uh, was depicted in the pictures. Do you guys support the cause for her to be fired or any actions to be taken against her? And um, have you guys in any way engaged with the department about Ivana's um, unlawful or the wrongful suspension before um, deciding to go the court route? Thank you. Um, I think we shall deal with the questions. I just want to check something with uh, Dr. Adam. Right, I'll, t I'll take the liberty just to uh, start with the questions and my colleagues on the right will interject uh, if it's necessary. Uh, the first question was pertaining to the, to the process and, and, and your question actually, is, it's, it's not a logical flow, but it's actually more of, a, of what's the legal framework or for the legal, legal gravamen of this. So Ms. Barkhausen is, the, is an employee specifically of the SGB. She's, she's a Section 24 appointment of the Schools Act, which means that the department do not have any say pertaining to the employee relationship between the. So that's why the point is made that, that the suspension was improper, even with consultation with the SGB. The, there's this interview with the, with the SGB also say, uh, trying to, to, to speak about the uh, suspension, but it was ultimately MEC Lahari uh, announcing the, the suspension. And the consultation with the SGB, taking that decision is not is not of relevance. So the legal government is, the, they, it, it is not the MEC, even with consultation, to make that decision. Understood. Um, the next question, there's actually, uh, which I think is important to deal with, is is the question of the photo itself. What does the photo say? What what conclusions can we draw? What can we what can we deduce from the photo? There were a few. Uh, um, questions pertaining to that, so I'll try and tie everything up in this response, and as I said, my colleagues will supplement. And also, I would at the end uh, uh, make mention to the, to the lady from Yakaranda, uh, which made the point about the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Trona education questions. I think if you, and, and having said this, do bear in mind that this question also would be most likely subject to the legal process going forward, so do bear in mind uh, it would, we would not be able to give you specific measurements and all those kind of details. But I would like to just, the best that we can do today is just to give you an idea of what was the thinking, what was the rationale behind this. And as I said, I invite my panel meeting members to, to, to join in. Um, for a proper response to this, one would actually have to start at the state of education in South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the reality that educators face on a daily basis. You can imagine the importance of, edu the, or the educational importance of the reception phase of learners. Now, just to recap our state of education in South Africa, do keep in mind that we had about 10 years of it more, uh, 10 years ago, but 1.14 million uh, uh, pupils entering grade, grade one. And in the grade 12 year, there's about 400,000 who has reached matric. And of those 400,000, we get the figure of 78.2%. So it's a striking question to ask where, what happens to those learners. And an explanation would be, and, and I want to start you with the task, the main task, if you want to ask uh, uh, MEC Lahari, what is his main job, what is he supposed to do? It's contained in the Schools Act, Section 3, I believe, 
and it states that he must provide sufficient infrastructure for learners, he must build sufficient schools. So what's the reality of what you have? The reality is that you have more and more learners growing and the school capacity to accommodate the learners, especially at the reception phase, is actually getting restricted and lessened. And also the quality of education. So having said all that, what's the net effect of this? The net effect is that because of, we can call it, the failures of government or the failure to uh, uh, um, expand and make ready the infrastructure, the language infrastructure, the school infrastructure pertaining to, to education, you get this triple down effect and that net effect, the entire brunt of that gets outplayed in the classroom. So then you have a situation where there's, no, there's not many enough quality schools in the vicinity and you get where four or five children out of 30 children or 35 children it's irrelevant what language, but cannot speak a one, not, not the two languages that can be, learners can be accommodated. So what does a teacher do? Is a teacher the political head of the province? No. Does a teacher make decisions on how these things must be dealt with? No. What does a teacher do? She or he is an educationalist. And therefore, the outcome that they would want to have at the end of the day, and I can actually just refer again to the photographs, the outcome is, I want children firstly to feel safe, I want them to feel that they want to be in school. I want to have them engage with other learners. So the first thing is I must make them comfortable. And then the great task, and it's, it's been stated on the method that was used. And do remember, it's not, uh, uh, Ms. Barkaisen is, is, the, is the person who, who took the photograph. But do keep in mind that you have to uh, um, make the children understand the task that they're about to do, and thereafter you would have interaction. So from an educational perspective, you could not done, have done it in any other way. Um, I'm not sure if my panel members want to uh, um, elaborate on that, but the point is this. Uh, the infrastructure, the school infrastructure, is not the such a state that it can absorb, and then you have, with those failures, it is the educationalist that, uh, uh, that has to address it, and this educationalist that would find a way and a method to best, uh, to have the best way possible, so that the, the outcome is there. They know their work, they know their friends, they interact with one another, and they go home a richer person, a more fulfilled person, and that is a part. And if you've seen the media, there have been lots of parents, black and white, elaborating on this, and say, my children is safe and my children is happy. For now, this is what we can uh, say on this. I'm just going to pass over to Dr. Adman. I hope I will um, cover the rest of the try my best. Um, on the question of uh, membership of uh, Yolanda Barkaisen, um, she wasn't a member of any trade union before this. And of course, this has major implications from a labor point of view. The logic thing for her was to contact a trade union and ask the trade union to represent her. She then joined Solidarity, and uh, we uh, um, said, um, of course, we will act on our behalf um, because he's a full paid of member now. Otherwise, he was actually there as individual. Um, and of course, we do it not only for Ilana Barkaisen, but we think it's important um, for the public um, interest as well. The um, um, question about the Tswana offering, I think that's the crux maybe of the problem here that the department did not succeed in um, a, uh, off, uh, in an offer for the province um, in a language that is predominant in that specific um, um, province. And now suddenly a grade R teacher is confronted to present an answer for that. Well, it's not her responsibility. And I think that's the crux, so if you ask me whether it's important for us um, that a Tswana offering um, is developed in the, northwest, in the northwest province, the answer is yes, yes, yes. But it's not that simple to say Swaziland Primary School must have now, must now become a Tswana or um, introduce a Tswana offering. It's much more complex than that that must introduce a comprehensive answer for the prominent language in that province. And I think that was part of this problem that this poor teachers was confronted with 
that the political heads did not present it. Then um, I just want to go through the others as well. Um, oh, you ask about the other teacher. Um, there's at this stage investigations by the department and they said that they will consider um, uh, suspensions after the investigations and that I only read in the media uh, but I believe that's true so she's not suspended in uh, the irony here is that in this specific case they listen to the other side I think if they listen to the other side the chances are there that they're not going to suspend that specific teacher that brings us back to the question and you said about the SGB that said that she's the culprit in the meantime we all know she's not the culprit anymore why she's still suspended then and uh, um, so the fact of the matter is thus that I think the facts are now on the table and that is why we say that suspension must be uplifted but despite of that even if there was substance to the allegations it was absolutely an all unlawful way to, that, to do that the problem came here there's a reason why in case law today it's expected from you to give someone an opportunity to give reasons why he or she must not be suspended. There's in case law a reason for that, but if you have a bundu activity where you simply don't care about case law and um, legal issues, and only about populism, then it happens that you suspend the wrong teacher. Because they did not ask um, uh, whether, uh, what's the reason why we must not suspend you. And remember, in all respect, the MEC had nothing to do with the specific teacher. He went way beyond his authority. Um, engagement, of the uh, engagement of the department. Again, therefore, uh, because of this um, the fact that the department um, is not... Um, was not supposed to um, suspend uh, our engagement with, is with the governing body and uh, the governing body is definitely aware of your legal actions we informed them about that and um, in this process this week of course they will get formal notice of that as well but no we did not engage with the department because we don't want to condone this um, weird kind of relationship that they wanted to establish between her, her them and the specific teacher. Um, I think, uh, hopefully we addressed ah, your seating arrangement questions. Uh, sorry about that. The, um, um, let me just start by saying the seating arrangement was not being done by our member because it wasn't a class. So, I think the formal processes will brought this out and I'm not sure that it's our place now to actually to try to explain on behalf of the other teacher why she actually arranged that specific seatings like she arranged that um, and um, so um, I'm very cautious to talk on behalf of the other teachers class um, but, yes? So my, my question is more in general. I mean, is, is this the kind of situation that, that happens in this bar case in this class? I mean, is this standard operating procedures or practices where if there are a few kids of certain races they put together, their no. name, are their name tags? No. When, when a kid comes into a class, is his or her name already on the desk? Okay. Is, or is it, you know, 20 kids come in and they individually assign the desk as they enter? I can. I can help you in a limited way with that. Um, in the first place, no, kids are, are not arranged according to race. There is no such an arrangement. Um, that was also not, not the case that specific morning. Um, what's important is that um, the kids and parents come to the school two days before and were introduced to where they will sit, what they will do, what's the rules, etc. So um, that was um, that that is done.
two days before on the Monday and the Tuesday, etc. And uh, um, the important thing here is that they are confronted with a reality of um, kids that can't speak Afrikaans and English and the department did not build any bridges to address this. And that is why it's necessary and that's a pity to bring, for instance, someone from home to try to facilitate that. And the moment that you must facilitate something like that and you must allow kids actually to feel at home and feel at ease by speaking to each other, then it's necessary from that point of view just for the introduction's sake. And that was in this case as well. Minutes later, when the introduction was finalized, um, these kids played again with all the other kids. So it's a very practical reason. Uh, um, reason. The other possibility was that you bring in the kids, you ignore the fact that they don't understand then you integrate them um, and they don't understand the kid next to and you don't take any care about trying to translate for them what's going on. And that will not be the interest of the kid at that okay. So the most important thing here is this, that they really get everything in them power and according to their knowledge to try to accommodate all kids, the success story of them is seen in the photos minutes afterwards, after the incident, and the other photos of a class. And the culprit yeah, is the department that does not give support here yeah, and build bridges for situations like this in classes. They leave it to their specific teachers do that, that's very, very unfair. Okay, two or three. Uh, two or three questions. Um, I'm just going to first take Gerard behind you as an attorney than yourself. And the third question, uh, Jack Rolanda, is, is there anyone who has not? Okay, it's fine. Gerard, um, Good afternoon, Gerard Pretoria from ETA. Just from a legal perspective, um, there's a legal recourse in the CCMA. Um, that you, that you, can, that you can use. Um, why the decision of conversion as an application? And do you foresee that can maybe be a little bit of a snag in the, in the, in the process? Okay, thank you. That's important. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, okay, the, of course, Nukhari from it. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Alex again from US24. Just two questions. Um, the uh, Northwest Department has obviously just now again reiterated that they got the right teacher. I'm just wondering if um, when uh, Mrs. Barkhausen was suspended, if she was at least told why she was suspended. Was she suspended because she took the photo, or was she suspended because they alleged that she is a teacher in question? And uh, if in your conversations, if you've had anything more out of the actual teacher whose class it was. And then my second question is based on um, what we just spoke about now with some of these little kids not being able to speak English or Afrikaans, and, the one teaching question brought in a, a, a domestic worker to help. What happens when that domestic worker doesn't come in in that class? And what happens in the rest that's, of the class? That's exactly that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's exact problem here. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Thank you. I'm a litigant and not a politician, so I'll keep to the litigation part of the questions. Uh, Gerard, your question relates to the CCMA. Uh, you will remember that our case is based on the unlawfulness of the suspension. The only case that you can refer to the CCMA is a matter of unfairness. You call it unfair labor practice. So our case is not based on solely on unfairness. Our case is based on the unlawfulness. Therefore, a policy, a contract, or any other uh, 
Act was not complied with, and that is the basis of our case. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to just a sort of broad answer on the uh, what was this racial segregation? Was this wrong? What exactly happened here? With Africa, we and you specifically have a massive problem in that we're obsessed with the team photo, but we don't really care about the scoreboard that much. Ms. Ilana Bach doesn't care about the scoreboard. She's got 15 years of experience as a teacher teaching young kids. None of us have ever stood in a classroom with grade R children who's now in that class for one hour. This is their very first experience of school. None of us have had to do that, yet we've written columns in which we tell this teacher how to do her job. I think we should seriously stick to our lanes here. She knows exactly what she's doing. She knows exactly how to integrate these kids. That's why at 9 in the morning, one single instance shows what you want to be racial segregation. Later that day, children are playing together, but that did not get reported because that doesn't fit the story. So we're focusing on the team photo, just ignoring the scoreboard, which is we're doing the best for these children educationally that we can. We need to stop writing for the South Africa we think we have and start writing for the South Africa we actually have, which is one where children in a rural town show up with no language, no language capabilities in Afrikaans or English and teachers bend over backwards to help them. It's not their job. It's the MEC who should be doing this. Yet she did his job for him. And then he shows up and stands on a stage and tells everyone that she should be suspended. This is absurd. We're living in a country where the government isn't doing their job, but we're letting them get away with it. But let a teacher do extra credit. Suddenly, she gets crucified for that. Yeah, that's it. Cornelia, you're strong. Thank you. That was real good questions in the first place. When the suspension was first announced on stage, it was all about the segregation of children. The first furious reaction of the public and the DA and later on the other political parties was all because of segregation of children. And her name was announced within that context. So the first context that her name was announced in is that there was segregation and therefore she's a racist. Later on, a few days later on, it became that, oh, no, she only took the photo. And now, of course, the department says, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, well, she took the photo, and that is why um, um, she must be suspended. But that was not the first context. But what's important here? We heard on the media about the context of segregation and, that's, um, and that she suspended. Um, we read columns. Um, we read commentaries about her and the suspension. We heard political parties calling that she must be re replaced by a black teacher. N nobody up to today explained to her why she was suspended. The SGB up to now haven't given her anything of substance about the suspension. In fact, later on, the Friday only, she received a one-liner that said, you are suspended with full pay. Totally unlawful. So, on that day, nobody said to her, listen, you are suspended because you are guilty of racial segregation, or um, we are expect um, segregation or anything. It was a media frenzy around her, she never heard anything. And up to now, we did not receive anything. And that is why it's so unlawful. Because, oh, first on the telephone, the uh, principal called her and said, and that was on the Wednesday. It is literally a minute, and we've checked that, literally a minute before the MEC went up stage announcing to the crowd the suspension of her. She received, received a call from her principal telling her that, listen, I just want to inform you that you are suspended because I don't want you to hear in the media. That was a call and later a one-liner. And that is why we are still waiting and that will be quite interesting in their reaction on your papers. What on earth will they now say? is the reason for a suspension. Because nowhere in labor law 
And even if you look at the guidance of the um, Schools Act, there's no way that you can suspend the teacher because she took a photo. There's no such ground. So it will be very interesting to see what they motivate for a suspension. Um, I think they've made a huge, huge mistake. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We are wrapping up now. There's one question left that I'll just quickly answer. Uh, it's from uh, the lady from Jacob Randa pertaining to, to Chana. And, and it's a very valid question, and we think these are the type of things we should talk and discuss more. Because how do you, how do you uh, get, how do we get at a stage that, for example, in Swaziland, okay, there's an, a Chana offering for the five year olds who can only speak Chana or can speak Chana best? Uh, First uh, response to the, uh, um, you need a political will from those who are decision making bodies to understand the reality of multilingualism, to also fully adopt the best practice when it comes to obtaining <coughs> knowledge and obtaining how you can gain knowledge and, and, and learn things. So that is that is unfortunately absent. But as the solidarity movement, the broader movement, we actively campaign for uh, a mother tongue education as a best method to impart knowledge and language. And as I said earlier, this is a explanation, an explanation why you have these many hundreds of thousands of learners which drop out from grade one to, to grade 12. Um, and and uh, um, you asked a question about the security as well. We don't have uh, information specific on the security situation uh, um, at, at the school at the moment. But uh, in short, you need a political will. But I think I hope this case and, and, and it would shed some light on the need to, to be, take truly be serious on the question of multilingualism. Thank you, Dr. Dirk Harman. We'll close and then we will, uh, um, from there on, be available afterwards. Can I just ask a one? Yes. I just want to find out how long has she been working at the school? Um, but also, I mean, reading from what we've heard here today, you are saying, in a nutshell, that she's been used as a scapegoat. Is <laughs> um, she's been fully employed at the school for two years. Two years, yeah. Yes, uh, and, but she's been in the education business since 2002. Yes, so she's a teacher for 15 years, indeed, yeah. She knows what she's doing, she's a very good teacher. You've got parents actually fighting to get their children in a class, black and white parents. As we've seen black and white parents talk to the media and explain that this is an extremely good teacher who made my child uh, become self-confident, who gave him, taught him Afrikaans, who gave him friends, all of those things. These things all happened, but they weren't really written, which is uh, something you need to ask yourselves why. Um, with regards to, what, what was the second part of the question, sorry? No, I, I, I was saying... Scapegoat. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, well, I think uh, it's more like a, a sacrificial lamb rather than a scapegoat. Yeah. As uh, we've got an NEC who has done nothing to help these children. This is a problem that has been there for a while because rural South Africa English is a foreign language. I grew up in Swaziland. I can only speak English by the grace of God. Nothing else helped me. Yeah. Um, so that means it's a foreign language, and we've got an ANC that's determined to continue making policy for a country they think they have, not the one they actually have which is one where children cannot speak Afrikaans or English but still need education. And Ms. Parker and all the teachers at school step in to fill the void that government leaves. And now after finding out they bend over backwards, they do stuff they shouldn't do in order to cater for the children because they care about the children. I think it's time we start doing the same. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Dirk Harman has to be yes, and he's actually got an interview. That's why he abruptly uh, or, or suddenly left uh, um, this, uh, the conference room. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, the conference is now concluded. Thank you. I think I don't. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>